All right. So um, for those of you who are on the call that don't know me, I'm Shannon Bender. I'm the branch manager of the Temecula office for Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. And um, I've been it, trying to get our title rep to do this Q&A for our office for about a month or so now. And this is a much more convenient way for us to come together and tackle some of those title questions that are um, they don't come up very often, but there's they're stuff that they do come up and we wanted to, uh, to have our um, title officer, Audrey, go ahead and answer them for us so that we could be better prepared if, when they do come up for us. So um, thank you, Michelle and Audrey, for putting, you know, meeting together to go over these questions. And so I'm gonna, um, they already have a list of questions that I've given to them. And anybody who's on the call right now, if you have other questions, if you could put them in the chat room, I'll go ahead and um, add those at the end of the session and we'll try to get Audrey to um, answer those. So without further ado, Michelle, I'm going to have you take it away because you've got my list of questions there. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, folks. So this is Audrey Hayasi. She's our title officer. We've worked together for many, many, many years, over 20 years. Something. Yeah, we're old. Um, so Audrey is um, the last link in closing your transactions. So she's the one that make sure that we're good to go, that we have all of our eggs in our basket that we need, that everything is covered, and that we're able to give clear insurance to the new purchaser. So the buck kind of ends at Audrey. So um, we're going to go ahead and go through these questions that uh, Shannon had provided. And um, then after, I guess, we're done with all of the questions, do you want to open up questioning? Q and A. Yeah, yeah, we can we can do that too. We can um, anybody who has questions, we could just maybe unmute their mics and have them individually ask. Okay. And we only we just have a handful of people, so it shouldn't be too much. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So we're gonna go ahead, Audrey. Okay. What's so, the first one? So there, your first question: How do you deal with transfer upon death deeds? So if if the grantor is still alive and are now selling their property. They just need to sign the sale grant deed like normal. And once that sale deed records, then that transfer on death deed is no longer in effect. Now, if the grantor is deceased, then title first has to verify the TOD was recorded because we have to make sure it was a valid TOD. So we have to make sure it was recorded within 60 days of execution. The property is residential or a condominium or agriculture land improved with a residence and no more than 40 acres. It has to fall under those criteria to be valid. If the TOD doesn't meet those requirements, then, then it's invalid. So once we verify that it is a valid TOD, then an affidavit of death needs to be recorded with the grantor's death certificate and then the beneficiaries will have to complete and sign before a notary an affidavit of beneficiaries transfer on death deed so once those documents are, are we receive uh, those documents then we would submit it to first american for approval so this tod it's only in effect until january 21 as of right now that's, it's gonna expire after that, yeah, after January 2nd. Okay, so then let's see, the next question is divorce decrees, quick claim deeds, and SI it has to do with those three things. So if we have a transaction where there has been a quick claim deed or an interspousal deed recorded, and we are asked, or we're asking for an uninsured deed affidavit, but the seller is unable to get that affidavit due to divorce, then we will take a copy, a full copy of that final divorce decree and verify that this seller was awarded the property and they have, you know, we're fine with allowing them to sell without um, getting the affidavit. But if that spouse or ex-spouse has any liens or judgments, we still need an SI. 
So right. we still have to get that, okay? That's exactly um, why I was asking that question because it happens a lot where um, one spouse keeps the property, but who knows what's still attached to the property in their name. Right, right. And we've had, we've had situations where they're like, well, we can't get any information, but then, you know, we'll ask, try and go through your paperwork, see if you ever, if you have anything, you know, that has their social and their driver's license, date of birth, they should know that, you know, it's just those really important things. They might be able to find some paperwork or even maybe get it from the attorney um, in order to satisfy our requirement. So on this, we've seen on several occasions. So if they did do a quick claim, uh -huh. and um, they are still in contact with their significant other, mm -hmm. would only the liens hit from before that quick claim was recorded and not after the recordation right. of the quick claim? Right, just okay. like any other, yeah. It, it, we have to clear you up until the day you came off the title. So, okay, let's see. Then the next question is, um, which is better for title, interspousal or quick claim deed? I mean, really, as far as the document, either one could be used, but when we're dealing with a husband and wife situation, it's better to use the interspousal deed because that interspousal deed already has the no transfer tax reasons on there. So then all you would do is check a box. Whereas if you use a quick claim deed, you have to add a reason for why you're not paying any doc stamps. And if you don't word it properly, the county will reject the document. So yeah, so that's why it's always best in a husband or wife subject to use the interspousal deed, okay? And then let's see, the next one was uh, tax sales and when is it insurable and what to be aware of. So when a transaction opens and we find there's a recent tax sale deed recorded, we look to see when it was recorded, what deeds of trust, liens, judgments the prior owner had, and the amount of the new transaction. So because the, because the, the county, um, the property taxes have priority over everything, they don't need to notice anyone that this property is in, in default and it's going to auction. So if the prior owner had an existing deed of trust or any other lien judgment, we will most likely decline to insure for at least 10 years. Wow, okay. But if we see that, you know, that it's not a, a huge liability transaction, the prior owner didn't have judgments, tax liens, deeds of trust, then chances are we, we'd be, we would be willing to insure, okay? okay? And if you have, we have had a case where the, the seller, I mean, he was like, he wanted to sell, but that buyer wanted title insurance. So we issued the prelim, but when we issued the prelim, we had to show all deeds of prior deeds of trust. We had to show all judgments, all tax liens. We had to show everything in that prelim. And the seller had to clear it up. So it kind of ended up canceling, but you know, but that's how it would have to happen if we were, you know, told you, they insisted on getting this prelim. Okay. Obviously, if a buyer were interested in purchasing homes through tax sales, they would need to get a prelim. I mean, it's highly recommended they get a prelim to find out what's attached to the home before, besides the, the, the taxes, to see what they're in for. Right, except most, but then that's like a prelim only, and a lot of us don't do prelim only, you know, so because they can go to the county too and down there and they can also do their own search at the county to see if there's things that, you know, but also a profile maybe uh, we might, the only thing your profile is not going to show you is judgments and tax liens if they have any, but as far as any open prior deeds of trust, right? You can always, you can always ask customer service to send those, you know, send everything to you for that. 
that the prior also, those deeds that are still attached to the property could they go after the new owner in a tax sale for that to clear that or no it's tax sale right well see we don't know if what the lender is going to do that's why if there's a tax sale when there's a tax sale and the prior owner had an open deed of trust. That's why we still have to consider it because we don't know what the lender is going to, how the lender is going to view it, what the lender is going to do, or if they're going to come back and demand some sort of payment. So that's, that's our concern. And that's why we don't insure. Well, and a tax sale doesn't always wipe everything out. So it's a risk just like buying at the courthouse steps. It's still going to be a risk. If you had the previous owner that had a, a common name, sometimes it's nearly impossible to clear, you know, liens or judgments. Um, if it's John Smith, uh, we can have this much of uh, uh, liens and judgments on a John Smith, and it's impossible to clear if we don't have the social security number, previous addresses, and previous employment history to clear those. So it depends. There's a lot of different but, scenarios that come into play yeah but it's just when you do like when it's a for, deed of trust foreclosure normally you it's going through a title company and the title company is going to issue a report a tsg report so that tsg report should be showing everything whereas when you're doing a tax sale through the county they don't have to do anything that's the difference because they automatically are priority everything so you know that's why super lean right got it Okay. Um, so along the same lines, I guess, with foreclosure is the liens of the HOAs, waters and trash bills. How is that handled? Right. So on that one, we, so we consider when it comes to like your solar, well, anytime if there's a foreclosure, um, we, it does wipe out that deed of trust, any deed of trust that's recorded after it of course gets wiped out anything prior to it doesn't um as far as like a notice of pending action no matter when that recorded whether it's before or after that we will always consider um when it comes to like a solar we the reason we show the solar is because the solar is to they record for those financing statements to secure their interest in the solar panels or whatever is attached to that property. And so that's kind of like personal property, but because it's attached to the property, that's why we still consider like a solar lien, even if we recorded prior to the deed of trust. So we look for that to be cleared. Same with the hero. If there's a hero prior and it's collected with the taxes, we still will show that because the hero will have to be cleared too. But other than that, we don't, we usually wipe everything out. If they have a, a IRS lien, if they have a federal tax lien though, that federal tax lien, the IRS in any foreclosure, the IRS always has what's called a 120 day redemption period. So if that party that was foreclosed on had an IRS lien, then we would have to show a code in our prelim regarding this 120 day redemption that the IRS has. So if we were to close prior to that, then we would need a release or we would want something from the IRS that says they're not gonna come back and redeem that property, okay? If they don't have any IRS liens or anything, we don't really worry about it. Okay. Do you have any questions on that one? I don't. No. Okay. Uh, let's see. So then there was the power of attorney and the trust. Yes, I've had this come up, so I thought it would be good to talk about. And, and in this situation right now that we're in where we're quarantined, We've got elderly people in um, places and their families trying to help them sell a home and the power of attorney wants to sign um, for the trust to sell the home. So what, what is your take on that? Okay, so when we're dealing with a trust and we're being, being told that 
that a grant deed is going to be or needs to be signed by a power attorney, we always ask why. That's like our very first question is why does a power of attorney need to be used? And then we would have to see a copy of the trust amendments and a power of attorney because we need to make sure that that power of, I mean, that trust provides for the trustee to execute a power of attorney and, and, a, and, a, and, and an attorney, in fact, can act on their behalf. We, we have to make sure that, that that's provided for in the trust. Because your trust always has a successor trustee and the reason for that successor trustee is because of death or incapacity, you know, if they can't act or resignation. So that's why when we're asked to take a power of attorney, that's where we're, we're really, really careful. So if, there, if the trust provides for this power of attorney, then and they are incapacitated then we do need two doctor's letters to state that and then we we would look at it to see if they are incapacitated i guess we would ask if that attorney in fact is not the same person as the successor trustee, then we would want to know why, because if they're incapacitated, the successor trustee should be acting. So, right. right? So, um, and then if, because we've also had where we've been told, well, there's so many documents that have to be signed and, you know, the trustee is elderly and there's just too many documents to sign, then, I would still ask for the grant deed to be signed by the trustee, but the other documents, you know, I mean, I don't know how it works with, with the brokers or with escrow, but if they're able to accept the power of attorney, they can't, because I can't, title can't speak for them. I don't know what their rules, laws, or whatever, you know, that is. But I just know for title, if that's the only reason the trustee doesn't want to sign is because there's too many papers, then I do need them to sign my grant deed, okay? And that's kind of what happens from time to time as the um, senior person gets older, it's just too much for them to handle, but I, I agree with what you're saying. So we just had another question come up. If the owner of a home is in Mexico and their son is in LA and wants to execute a power of attorney so he could help his parents execute the sale, um, and he gets help from title. Can he get help from title or escrow? I don't quite understand that, Anne. Is this with a property that's being held in a trust? I'm not sure. I'll have to get back to you on that one. Anne could maybe clarify her, her question. So what I've seen with some of my agents, and I get on the horn with Audrey, is some folks think that they can use a uh, power of attorney for mere convenience. And you can't do, use a power of attorney for mere convenience. There needs to be a necessity or a reason to use that power of attorney. So, you know, oftentimes it's used as, uh, as a tool just to be more convenient and that's, it, that won't fly um, for title. And I think that just answered the question because she said the parents don't want to travel. So, yeah. But see, so so in a case like that, okay, if they're now saying they now want to execute a power of attorney, then what my what I would be saying is, well, then instead of having them sign the power of attorney, have them sign the grant deed for title, right? So that's what I would say in a case like that, okay. And so um, along the same lines, how long does a power of, is a power of attorney good for? Is there a timeline on that? Well, if it's a durable power of attorney, usually a durable power of attorney, it's good for, it's good until basically the person passes because the durable power of attorney is is a power of attorney that has to do with not only to use now, but to also for the attorney in fact to use upon the principal's incapacity. So 
if we're so if we're provided a power of attorney that's like because i've taken one that's six years old but it's because the uh the principal is unable to act for themselves then i would just need a letter a doctor's letter a physician's letter that tells me what's wrong but because i need to number one make sure they're still alive right so and then number two I need to know that they are incapacitated and not able to act for themselves. So once I have that verification with the physician's letter, then I can take a power return, a durable power return that's old. But if it's just a special power return, um, can't be older than a year, and it's, it has to be specific to my transaction on a special. A general power return, I usually do not I mean, that is up to the party, but it's best they don't execute a general because you're giving your attorney, in fact, the ability to use that power of attorney for everything. So, okay, that's the difference. So another question for you um, uh, along the, the Mexico um, question just came up. So can a um, person get a grant deed in Mexico and get it notarized there and mail it back? Yeah, they would have to go to the consulate. Because even if they did a proper attorney, they'd have to go to the consulate. Right. Okay. Is, right. is the consulate open right now? I thought that they were closed down everywhere. Yeah, I'm sure they are closed down everywhere. I, I'm so, sure they are. I don't know. And, in Mexico, but yeah, then that's the problem right now is there's a lot that people can't do because we can't record a document without having that notary. Okay, and actually one more question for you, Audrey. Um, we were on a call with Mark Stark yesterday and Arizona and Nevada are starting to do, um, it's not e-notaries, it's virtual notaries. So yeah. any idea status on California? Well, with California, I believe that they are, the CLTA, I think, sent a letter to um, Governor Newsom trying to get that passed because we okay. don't do virtual notaries here at all. So oh, there are states that do it, but it's, it's not here. So, um, yeah, so he's trying to get that passed. But until then, um, the county will not accept any of those documents. Because I'm sure the county needs to see how it works, too. You know, because there's no notaries out here that does such a thing. Because it hasn't Over. happened here, so, yeah. They would have to have cert, uh, some kind of training, I would imagine. Right? Yeah, exactly. Which, exactly. With Arizona done, so we would have to do that, too, I guess. Because I believe how the virtual, you know, like right now, your notaries, they have a book. Like that's how they keep their log. But with the virtual, it's all recorded just like this. It's video. So you have to save that video and yeah, because that acts kind of like your your book. So okay. All right. One more okay. question. Is a signed and notarized grant deed enough to use to close an escrow um, and closing documents? That's still on the I'm Anne, why don't you unmute yourself and then ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> Gonna find her. Anne? Is she on her phone? Possibly. If you're on your she phone, star phone. six. Uh, if you're on your computer, you'll just um, go down to the bottom. I'm trying to find you on here to unmute you. There you are. Let me unmute you. Okay, now you're unmuted, Ann. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the reason for the Mexico question is because the parents are elderly, they're U.S. citizens, and they're worried about this coronavirus and coming back to the U.S., and traveling uh, to execute closing documents, etc., later on in the summer here. And the son is willing to handle everything, but the parents are worried about traveling because they're elderly. So, Anne, on this one, is it in a trust? No. No. Well, 
then okay so they're not planning to sell the property now they're they're in the summer in the summer they have a we have a buyer and uh, we're interested in uh <clears throat> delaying it a little bit to July, but I don't know if they may not even want to travel in July. So that's the question. And the right. sun okay. is here. Okay. The okay. So in a situation like that, then yeah, I would say that they can go ahead and execute a, uh, a special power of attorney um, to their son. And but I would kind of wait because the like um, I mean the because I don't think they can go to the consulate right now anyway, right? Right. That had to be so, the, U the U.S. consulate, right? Yeah. So I think they they would. I mean, so if they're not planning to sell right now, then maybe they should wait until closer to July and see. And if they're not, if the situation is the same or they're afraid to travel, then we would go ahead and take a special power of attorney. They would have to go get it um, notarized at the consulate. And uh, that would just be the reason. When we ask why are we being asked to use it, then we would want, maybe they can give us like a, attached to that power of attorney a letter as to this is why we're having our son, you know, appointing our son um, as the attorney in fact, because we don't want to travel back and forth because of the virus, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, they could do that. But then yeah. the son, how are you going to get a special power of attorney if the son has to be there to show his ID? He doesn't no, want he to doesn't. travel. To make the it. son doesn't have to show anything because he doesn't sign it. The oh, son doesn't sign it. Okay. Only the principals. The okay. Parents. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, okay so, so go ahead what's our next question so the next question is um owner carried foreclosures meaning the owner uh carried a note and then the property foreclosed how do you um is there anything we should be aware of on that foreclosure so okay wait so are we so we're saying that we it's like a seller carry back yes and then it's okay. and then it foreclosed then the the seller then that then the I mean because the prior owner who would who is the party that should have had the deed of trust on the property they're the ones that would foreclose on the property so they would now just own the property again I mean however any, any cloud to title or something because would the person who's buy who was trying to buy it have any things noted on title. Who was trying? Okay, so okay, so I'm confused on that one. Okay, so a seller carry back. There's two different types of seller carry back. So sometimes a seller carry back full financing. If seller takes back, if they're carrying the full mortgage and only that seller is financing, then they would foreclose and they would get the property back. But if the seller carried back a portion and that buyer ended up getting institutionalized lending, then the, that one's a duck and one's well, a so dog. I guess there it depends on, so if the, if the seller has the second on the property, then, and the first forecloses, then the, the second gets wiped out. But if the seller has the only mortgage on the property, then really what they would do, being a private Benny, they would do what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. And that's how the seller would get the property or the, the prior owner would get the property back. So normally they don't do a formal foreclosure. They just do what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure where the current owner now says, you know, I can't, I can't afford it anymore and go ahead and take it. Just, you can have it. And then they just sign that deed in lieu of foreclosure with, with an estoppel affidavit that has to be attached. So telling everybody that, you know, this deed was not signed under duress or anything. And then the, the beneficiary or prior owner would now own the property. What happens if that owner that is doing the deed in lieu of foreclosure, what happens if he has liens or judgments? That's where he is basically taken subject to. Okay. Yes. 
Sellers with judgments from bankruptcy, do they show as liens or can they be cleared? Okay, so when a seller has a judgment and the seller tells you that it's been cleared or wiped out by a bankruptcy, then, then what title does is we, once you guys tell us, you know, the seller said that this should have been cleared through the bankruptcy, then we, what we do is we go in and we check their bankruptcy case. We look at it to see, there's three things that, well, I, I look for. It's, I look to see when the seller acquired the property, when the judgment recorded, and then I will pull their bankruptcy case to look to see, okay, did they schedule that judgment through their bankruptcy? And is their bankruptcy now discharged? Was it a chapter seven? Chapter sevens will discharge debts. Chapter 13 does not. So if that chapter seven now is discharged and that uh, judgment was scheduled, now when I look to, I look to see, you know, when did they acquire this property? When did the judgment record? So if they owned the property at the time the judgment recorded, that judgment is considered a secured debt. So it's secured by the property, just like a deed of trust. Okay, so if they're saying that, well, we, it was taken care of through bankruptcy, then the only way that that judgment can be uh, wiped out by that bankruptcy is the attorney has to motion the court to get what is called an order avoiding lien. So once the court approves this order avoiding lien, then once it's filed, we would need a certified copy and we would record that. And so when we record that, that acts like a release for the judgment, okay? So, and I could tell you 90% of the time or 95% of the time, I don't know why attorneys, I don't know if they just don't know that a separate order has to be issued or if they just don't want to take the time because you know that does require more time and it does cost more money because the attorney now has to schedule you know a motion with the court and maybe they have to go back and they have to get this order and do all that so i don't know if that's the reason but 95 percent of the times we have to now the the seller has to go back has to reopen their bankruptcy case has to have you know get this motion approved and all of that so but that's what we need in order to wipe out the judgment, okay? Otherwise, it'd have to be paid if we don't get that order. That's terrible. And then the other thing is, though, if that judgment, okay, so say they didn't own the property at the time that that judgment recorded, then that judgment actually is considered an unsecured lien. So if they did schedule it in their bankruptcy and the bankruptcy is discharged, then I will take it out. It's rare that I see that, but once in a while I do see that. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Next question. Um, you're using all your brain power today. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I made sure. <laughs> Uh, su supplemental property taxes. Um, two questions. When do they become a lien? And um, how does it work with flippers if the supplemental tax has not been issued um, or paid yet when they take over the property? Or maybe when they sell. We sell again. the property, right. Sell yes. Again. yes. So, well, supplemental taxes, they usually are issued anywhere from six months to a year after the purchase. So if you're dealing with an investor who is turning around and selling it soon after he acquired it, then what will happen is when that supplemental bill gets issued, sometimes the county will catch that, okay, we issued this supplemental bill, but it's on a prior owner. So then they will take that supplemental bill and put it on the unsecured roll and then eventually they record the, a certificate of lien. 
against, and so then that certificate of lien is posted against the investor. So, you know, so we have to clear it just like any other um, lien. person. Yeah, any other lien, it would get caught at that time. So it's against but, the person. It's against the person, not necessarily the property, because it was the prior owner's responsibility. Right. Exactly. So, and if and if you have, say, a buyer who uh, says, you know, like calls you and says, you know, we bought this property, blah blah blah, and now I got this bill, and it looks like it, and it's not mine, and it, you see that, oh yeah, it has to do with that investor then what the new owner can do is contact the county tax collector and let them know that this bill is for the person that sold me the property. And then what the county will do is ask, well, when did escrow close? And then they can check it. And once they check it and see, oh yeah, it's the prior, they will take it off, throw it on the unsecured and record their lien later. So that's how that works. Okay, next question. Um, are there any counties that do not accept funding and recording at the same day? We know Riverside County does, but are there others that don't? Ventura, Ventura and LA, they do not re, um, accept same day recordings. They do eight o'clock. So, so in those two counties, you, you, they only do eight o'clock recordings. So we will have to fund today. So if it funds today, we, you cannot record until tomorrow. So Riverside, all the others, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, Orange County, those four counties, they do do specials. So you can fund record same day. And the cutoff time, so for like Riverside, the cutoff time is 3.30. So we need to make sure we're able to release our file by 3.30. So, which means I have to have my docs, I have to have the vans, I have to have my funds, all of that has to be in before we can release it. Okay, so, you know, a lot of times, and this is where we're always like getting on escrows because sometimes they tend to send us stuff like last minute. And, you know, we don't want a mistake. I mean, this, the one thing we don't want is to have a mistake because if, you know, if there's, a mistake in the vesting or anything and now and it records that requires a re-recording and that is something we do not want to have to do because then it's trying to find everybody get docs re-signed and all this other stuff. so so we're always stressing get us the docs as soon as you can mm -hmm. well and sometimes a lot of times it just depends on the escrow officer sometimes that escrow officer keeps all of the pertinent things that we need they keep it in their file and then they send everything to title together the day of recording. So that means that we don't have SIs. We've never seen SIs. We've never seen sometimes the demands. Um, so if they send it the day of recording, instead of sending us trickles, they send us the whole kit and caboodle day of recording. Sometimes we get it an hour before it needs to go and then that's where the problems arise. So if a client has a seller that has a common last name, I always tell my agents, if it's John Smith or if it's a common name, when your client sends that SI into escrow, if you can CC me, I'll get it to Audrey so we can clear the, the general index. Because sometimes if it's John Smith or uh, Maria Garcia or uh, just a common name, if we don't have that SI, sometimes we'll only show one lien on the prelim, but there can actually be a hundred liens with that name. We don't show all of them on the prelim. It would be like a Bible. So if it is a common name, I always make sure the agents know, just CC me, send it to me so that I can get it to Audrey ahead of time. And, and just to add to that, now that we're talking about SIs, it's really important that those SIs get filled out. I mean, a lot of times, you know, they don't put 10 years of residence, they don't put their 10 years of, of employment, you know, and some, they don't driver's license. And so it's like, I need, 
especially on a common name, I do need all that information because not every document that report, every lien or judgment that records doesn't have a social. So that's why we look at their 10 years of residence and 10 years of employment. So, yeah, so some like, of a lien like, or a like, judgment will have an address where it was mailed to. So that's how we can find out that that was a hit, that was our person. And we don't use the SI to find bad things on good people. It's quite the opposite. We use a, a statement of information so that we don't show bad things that are not our person. So a lot of people get offended when they have to fill that out. You know, and again, if you have a divorce, you have to put it on there because if not, we will find out. We will find out. We've had sellers that have been divorced and have complete families that the new wife has no idea about. Because child support. We pick up child support needs and judgments. So, so if you leave that out, it will still come back and bite you in the rear. And if, if that happens, we'll call the agent. I can't tell you how many times I've called an agent and I've said, I'm so sorry, but you'll need to have this discussion. And so then the agent's kind of like between a rock and a hard spot. You know what I mean? But again, you have to fill out everything. Right. And I feel like sellers don't um, fill them out completely because, oh, there's only two lines for 10 years worth of information. And they just don't, they're reluctant to add that extra page, no matter how much you tell them or it's written on there. Yeah. We'll take my paper. <laughs> or, or even on the back. They could even write it, just flip it over and write it on the back of the SI, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Moving on. So, um, do you see very many um, notary mistakes, and what are the most common? <laughs> well, notary the the I guess the biggest notary mistake we see is with the with the names, and it, I don't think it's really so much a notary mistake as maybe the notary doesn't know because on your document, you know. On the deed, you have the grantor section, you have the signature section, and then there's a notary. So the county looks to make sure that the name matches in all three places. So if it's like John, De John say on title, we have John J. Doe. And so he's on the top like that at the signature where they type his, type his name, they type John J. Doe. But then all of a sudden you have the notary and the notary puts John Joseph Joe or whatever, right? So then now, okay, names don't match. So we have to, we will, we, if that is fixable, and that's where we have to add AKA and, and into the document and do all of that. So, but where this sometimes is a problem is, like Michelle was saying, we get our docs at the last minute and all of a sudden we find, oh my God, these corrections need to be done. So this is where we're like always asking escrow, can you please look at look the documents over before you send them to see if their a notary has done something different or made a mistake or once in a while they forget to put the county or their county. So you know then we have to call and and or they have to call especially when it's out of out of state or I have to go on the internet to see if I can find what county this notary's in and. So, but the most common one is just with the name. The name doesn't match in all three areas. So another thing with notaries is like Audrey was saying, we can fix things. We can fix notaries or, or problems with notaries on a grant deed. However, no, I, can't, I can't fix the notary part. No, not the notary, but you I can do the, the, the name. The document part. But Audrey cannot touch a deed of trust. She cannot manipulate yeah, anything on a deed of trust. So if, um, if maybe an initial was left out on a grant deed or something, we can add the initial on a grant deed, but we can't do any changes to a deed of trust. So if something is wrong and we get the deed of trust an hour before they want to record it and there's a problem with the deed of trust, guess what? The lender has to fix that. And then, you like I have people say, "Do I have to sign my middle initial? I never ever sign it." I mean, and they don't, you know, because the county takes. So however you sign, the county looks at it as far as your signature goes. They look at it as, well, if this is how you sign. This is how you sign. But the type part, 
you know, the typed part all needs to be correct. Do you remember that one document that came through and it was notarized and they signed in Chinese? Yeah, they take the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've taken that too. Okay, have you ever seen a closing pulled after recording? No, I've never seen a closing pull after recording. All right, so we're getting to some fun stuff. So we live out in the wild, wild west and uh, we need to talk about marijuana. Uh, so on <laughs> marijuana houses, if um, deemed a former grower house, will you insure it with title? Yeah, no, I mean, no, our, our underwriter, they, they've sent us a bulletin st stating that we are not allowed to insure any property that is to be used for growing or harvesting or selling marijuana, where we don't have the authority to close those transactions. Okay, but if, if remediation's been done on the property, would you be able to insure it at that point? If what was if reverted, Like reverted back to a regular house, they had it all as a grow house and now it's been remediated and cleaned and all of that, would you be able to insure it if you knew it was prior <laughs> grow house? I mean, I don't, I, but, I, I want to say yes, it's just what, yeah, am I going to get that, do they get a permit that says, or do they get something from the city that says it's now just a single family residence? As long as we get something, have some sort of proof that it's now become just a regular single family residence or a, or just a, a commercial whatever that they're not using for that, but, you know, selling something else or, yeah, I, I don't see why we can't. I mean, I, I guess there's no way for us to, I mean, we as realtors, we know, because we're in the property, but as title, you don't see the house. You wouldn't know if it was a former grow house. So you just see a property address come across, and we and as realtors know that. So then what? If I never knew that it was one, I I would still insure it. It's just a house. You know, the only, house. Yeah, we've only, I've probably had maybe two transactions in this whole time where, and the only reason I knew that um, what was gonna be grown on the land is the agent told me. Otherwise I wouldn't have known, you know, what, so I mean, I was very appreciative that they told me because, you know, I didn't wanna have some sort of problem with First American as to why did you insure this? But yeah, so that's why if you guys, you know, if, if know that this is what their intention is, we, it, I mean, we appreciate it if you let us know because we have been told we're not allowed to ensure that. But if they, if the agent does know if they are aware and it never gets back to title, I think that that legal ramification would end up going back to the agent, right? The brokerage. If the agent knew but didn't disclose and they found out after. As far as them um, intending to use it for growing mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure so um this is probably a no but the question is if it's an industrial um warehouse that's approved for a dispensary is that still a no for you guys it, yeah they still told us no all right um, so and if first american is telling us no they're our underwriter then that would mean that they would not be able to do it either right yeah obviously Okay, so um, moving on to a different subject. What are the title requirements of my seller if the vesting is an LLC or a corporation? When it's a, well, for an LLC, then we need, title would need to see the operating agreement because we need to see, you know, who all the members are, who, the, who is the manager, um, for this LLC because the manager is who can execute all the documents. So we also, and then we will run them to make sure they're, in, they're still active and in good standing. And with the corporation, we um, ask for the articles, the bylaws. We do check to make sure they are in good standing. And we will ask for a corporate resolution because with this corporate resolution, that resolution, sh that document should contain that they, they held a meeting, 
they agreed to either the sale or the purchase of this property. And um, what they agreed for the, what the purchase price is, if it's a purchase, I mean, sorry, if it's a sale, what the sales price is, if it's a sale, and who is authorized to sign all the documents on behalf of that transaction. I always let my agents know as well is when they have an LLC that is the seller, um, the Secretary of State, I have my agents go online to the Secretary of State of California and anyone can run the name to see if they're in good standing. So that would be something that would be good for the agent to hop on to the Secretary of State of California website just to see early on. Because if you wait and you invest this time into this deal, and you could have seen that it, they were in bad standing or not in good standing, or that they were no longer active, you'd wanna know that at the beginning of a transaction. So when my agents do call me and they don't know what to do with an LLC, that's one of the first things we can go on and log on together. I'll show them how to do it and they can log on to the Secretary of State for an LLC as well as a corporation. So you can run them. So I guess then the requirements would be the same if it was a buyer who was buying as an LLC or a corporation? Yes. Now, when it also, um, the LLCs and the corporations, they do need to be filed in California because you, you have a lot of LLCs that are Nevada and corporations too, Nevada, Delaware. So they, if they're gonna transact business in California, then they are also supposed to be filed here in California, okay? All right, so uh, the seller has um, parents who have passed away. Um, what does title need from probate? What forms do you need? Well, okay, so if we're, if, we say parents, so if we're saying, say mom and dad are still on title, the, then number one, you wanna record an affidavit death for the first one that passed. So you would record an affidavit death for the first one that passed, and then the, the surviving one is the one you're gonna do a probate on. So it all depends on type of probate. If you do the, what's called the Independent Administration of the State Act, then what I need is I need to record its letters. It's the letters of administration or testamentary. And those letters have to say that they have full authority. So as long as they have full authority, then that will allow the executor or administrator, or however they're appointed, to go ahead and sell the property. Now, if it's limited, then I will need an order confirming sale. reason that we all have our, um, our, our trust set up, right? So we don't ever have to do that. All right, last question I have for you. Um, my client did is back to bankruptcy. Uh, let's see, it's about, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, my client did bankruptcy a few years ago. It closed. I'm in escrow and shows I have a Discover card. Discover card was part of my bankruptcy. What does title need to do to get rid of, I guess, the Discover card? Did, did, well, did, well, did Discover record a judgment? I'm not sure. It's not my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there's no, if there's no recorded, because I can only pick up what's recorded, what's of record. So if they are just sending her letters or, or whatever for collection or a collection agency is, and there's no judgment recorded, then I don't know about it. Sounds like it should have been wiped clean with a, a bankruptcy, but it's not showing. So, all right, I'm going to let that one go. So I'm done with my questions. And I know we've got quite a few people out there watching. Does anybody, if you guys have any more questions for Audrey and Michelle, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Any other questions? Sometimes, and if you're on your phone, you can do star six and that should unmute you as well. Okay, no more questions. 
So I, I just have a question from Joe go over just a minute ago. Joe McGowan, does he still have a question? It was just who's confirming that the consulate would need to be the U.S. consulate in um, Mexico. Yes. So, yep. Oh, there's Jen. <laughs> you guys rock. This was super helpful. Okay, great. I'm glad it went well since this was like the test. Uh, <laughs> it went really well. The next one, though, we're having a pajama party. We all have to be in our pajamas. <laughs> That's I want to say I want to say thank you so much for putting it together, Michelle. I really appreciate it. And these are just tough, weird questions that come up from time to time, and mm -hmm. thought it was helpful for everybody to um, to hear the answers here. But obviously, we've got you, uh, Michelle, and our reps in our areas that will help us um, answer these questions. We don't often get to talk to our title officer directly, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Oh, no and problem. With that, I guess um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to let it go for today. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you.